every year we have a memorial lecture to the Smiths, um, and I want to emphasize that it's the Smiths, not JLB Smith only, but it's the Smiths, Margaret, Mary, and JLB. Um, a very special couple who we know um, had a marked impact on um, ecology and indeed aquatic science in Africa. Um, JLB and of course um, Marjorie Port Latimer um, in the late 1930s um, found the coelacanth and identified it as something special and put a little rural town in Eastern Cape on the world map. Uh, and if you look what uh, that fateful day in December, right back in 1938, what that's resulted in, it really is quite an amazing South African story. Um, certainly JLB uh, drove the whole field of ichthyology. He uh, made himself a renowned world ichthyologist. Sadly, he took his own life in 1968. And as much as he contributed to the science of ichthyology and being an expert ichthyologist, Margaret, his wife, took the field to the people and really drove the formation of the institute and drove the discipline and drove getting a whole plethora of students, including Paul Skelton, who was the first one of the first students. And out of that came the Department of Ichthyology and Fishery Science and then the J.L.B. Smith Institute and then obviously SIAD, as a South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. So one can see how one, one afternoon in East London made a huge difference to the Eastern Cape, to Rhodes University, to the National Research Foundation, and that really is due to two very, very special people who actually share a birthday, um, which is on the 26th of September, uh, and that's why we always have a, um, a lecture in their honor um, at this time of the year. Um, we alternate between uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I think that's particularly apt because of the role that Margaret played and the fact that we really want to promote women in science. Often you stand up here and you, uh, you're introducing someone who's a pioneer in the field, who's special in the field and everything. It's not every time you have the opportunity to do the same, but also add that they're a close friend. Um, Judy was uh, special in my life. She uh, proofread my honours thesis, which turned out to be a seminal work in ichthyology. <laughs> um, by the time she had proofread and edited it, I'm not sure whether she should have got the honours degree or myself. Uh, but uh, Judy uh, was a year ahead of me in ichthyology at DIPS. She is a homegrown product out of the Department of Ichthyology and Fishery Science. She has a CV that splits for nooks. Um, going to the Ocean Adaptic Research Institute, first as a researcher, um, and then moving on to SeaWorld, becoming the director of SeaWorld, then becoming the director of the whole organization, which is Sambra. And then she's done something which is the most amazing feat I've ever seen in my whole life, um, which I think every director of the institute wishes for. She then decided to keep the portfolio she wants, Okay, and got a new director in to do the portfolios she didn't want to do. Um, so she now concentrates in terms of strategy and conservation and taking science to society. She recently got a doctorate uh, from University of Queen Queensland, Queensland um, and she'll be speaking tonight about from the Smiths to uh, social media. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Judy Manley. Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for coming to this presentation today. I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a cultural and a spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. How many of you agree with this statement? How many of you think it's absolutely false? No one. Right. I would like us to take this as the starting point of my presentation. And my presentation is all about people. 
So think about that statement because I disagree entirely with that statement. And hopefully by the end of my presentation, you will see why. When I started here in Grahamstown in 1986, which was just the <laughs> other day, as a young student in the ichthyology department, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be back here doing the Smith Memorial Lecture. So thank you very, very much for this honor. It is an incredible honor and an incredible privilege to be with you tonight. And I know that my dad, who introduced me to my love of fish, would be incredibly proud of me tonight. <laughs> my dad's love of fish was actually inspired partially by J.L.B. Smith. My dad lived in the Trans Sky, and he accompanied J.L.B. Smith on a couple of field trips where they did what scientists did in those days, which was kill everything in sight, and then work out what it was. And this 1954 edition of Smith Sea Fishes has been a treasured possession in our home for many, many years. So my relationship with J.L.B. Smith goes back to even before I was born. A little bit after that, probably the early 1980s, we came down here on holiday and my dad had discovered some tiny little fish that suddenly appeared in a, a pond or a dam that had been dry for many years. He wanted to know where these little fish came from. So we used to often pop in here to buy some posters, have a look at the displays. This time he wanted to find a scientist who could help tell him where these little fish came from. And this young scientist very kindly took us up to his office and spent half an hour with these complete lay person he'd never met in his life and told us how these little fish could have got into that dam and made us feel important. Now, the reason I'm telling these two stories is because they epitomize what science communication is about. I think so often we get caught up in the technology, we get caught up in the research, we get caught up in the theory, but we forget that we're all human. Those one-on-one -on -one interactions where we as scientists talk to people and we share our passion, that is the essence of science communication. After I finished my master's, I was very privileged to get a position as the education officer at the South African Association for Marine Biological Research, a very unique non-government organization based in Durban. And we operate the Oceanographic Research Institute Ushaka SeaWorld and the SeaWorld Education Center. And I've been privileged to have since then been able to work for an organization that shares my passion, which is helping people to care for the ocean. My first guided tour of the aquarium, I was armed with a master's degree. I had a group of 15 year olds from a rural area near to Coxstead. I was going to give them the tour of their life. We did lateral lines, we did otoliths, we did respiration. It was a brilliant guided tour. At one stage, obviously, I paused, and a little youngster put up his hand, and he said to me, Ma'am, is there water in those boxes? I was mortified. I could not believe that I had just set off on such a bad footing. But even though it was a terrible experience for me, it taught me a very important lesson. Get to know your audience before you start to share your knowledge. So I decided after many years working in the aquarium, I finally got to study my new research species. So I would like to introduce you to my research species. Homo sapiens, distribution pretty much global, habitat terrestrial, we're an omnivore, we eat just about anything. Predators, not many. We're the only, one of the only few species that has sexual reproduction that we do just for fun as well. <laughs> our reproductive rates could only be described as exponential and our behavior could only be described as irrational. So this is my new research species. Because for very long in our environmental and in our conservation work, we've spent a huge amount of time studying the prey. We thought that if we understood how fast it reproduces, if we understood its habits, if we understood its biology, we would be able to look after our natural environment. Unfortunately, we haven't spent nearly enough time studying the predator. 
Because ultimately, if we understand the predator, we might be able to achieve our conservation goals with the prey. So let's have a look and see the attitudes of South Africans to the environment. What do South Africans really think about the environment? So the first thing I'm going to do is a study that was conducted in 2010 around the whole of South Africa. And they were looking at what the most important issues that are confronting South Africans. What do you think their responses were? What are the most important things that we're dealing with in South Africa today? Kill it. Crime. Sorry? If it moves, kill it. If it moves, kill it. Crime. Yes? Racism always happens. Yes, that pops up. Yes, what else? Service delivery. Service delivery. Houses. Service houses, delivery, water, houses service. Poverty. Poverty. Entitled. Unemployment. Okay, let's see what the responses were from the people they asked. Unemployment. 80% of the people put this as the top one. HIV AIDS. 44% said this was the most important issue. Crime and security issues. 42%. <clears throat> Poverty. 38%. So you're all pretty much on a par here. Service delivery, 21%. Okay, so I'm giving you about 60%. You did pretty well. Let's see where the environmental issues that we think are so important fitted. Okay, so protecting the environment and climate change didn't even feature on the list. Let's look at a few other points from this particular study. The statement was, we worry too much about the future of the environment and not enough about jobs today. What percentage of South Africans would say they agree with this? Lots. Lots. Nearly 50%. Okay, let's have another one. Economic progress in South Africa will slow down unless we look after the environment better. Okay, what percentage do you think agreed with this statement? <laughs> okay, we're, quite, we're getting quite negative here. 40%. <laughs> Things are not so bad. Let's have a look at the next one. Even if the environment is not protected, people will always find a way to survive. Any guesses? 90, 70, 45%. Okay, so it's not all, not all bad news. Right. Now we honed in in this particular study, they wanted to say, if you did have to think about the environment, what were the environmental issues that you would think are the most important ones? What do you think people came up with? Water, pollution. Okay, we're, we're a bit better on this one. Let's have a look. Unclean water, 20%. Littering. It's amazing how often littering pops up in these surveys. Unclean air and wasting water. All of these environmental issues that people selected were things that impact people directly. So they're things that you can see and they're things that you can feel, which is important when we communicate about the environment. What percentage of people agreed with this statement? It's just too difficult for someone like me to do anything about the environment. Okay, let's see. 55%. So half of the people said it's just too difficult. Ah, we asked people who should look after the environment. What do you think the response was there? <laughs> 33% said the government. So a third of the population of South Africa feels that it's the government's responsibility to look after the environment. So let's see what local councillors who are government think about the environment. This is a study that was conducted right here in the Eastern Cape. What percentage of these local councillors interviewed had no training at all in the natural environment? Not one little bit. <laughs> Eighty-six percent. So on the one hand, the people of South Africa think it's the government's responsibility to look after the environment, but many of the people that are in the positions of power maybe don't have the necessary skills. What percentage of these councillors identified the natural environment as a priority in their work? 
<laughs> but on the other hand, they did feel that the natural environment was important for tourism, which was important for job creation. So there are some positives. What was the percentage who viewed conservation as a negative in their work? <laughs> Nearly 50%. So these are the people, our people in South Africa, that we're communicating with, that we're sharing information with. We need to understand our audiences. Now, I've been working at our organization, the Aquarium, for quite a few years now. And we work on this wonderful premise that visitors enter as little environmental devils. They undergo this life-changing experience and they emerge two hours later as little environmental angels. But after maybe the first 20 odd years, I started to doubt this model. And I started to think maybe we need to understand what we're actually achieving with all the visitors that we have in the aquarium. So, Instead of just saying, well, let's do a quick survey, like some silly person, I decided to do a PhD on it. And I started to look at our visitors. And I wanted to understand how their pre-visit attitudes and motivations were influenced by the visit and how that predicted their post-visit learning. So I wanted to understand who our visitors were, what they did when they visited us, and what they learned when they left. So we'll go through just some of the results. This was a short eight-page survey that our poor visitors had to complete. Never ever make people complete eight pages of surveys. What did we find? Now we're looking at visitors to a shark a sea world. So we're looking at a small group of people, representative. Humans are severely abusing the environment. What percentage agreed with that? Now remember, these are self-selected. They've chosen to come and visit us. 85%. Okay, so there's a recognition that the environment is important. Humans were meant to rule over the rest of nature. 43%. So we have a strong anthropocentric attitude towards nature. One of the best predictors of environmental behavior is people's internal connectedness to nature. So how connected they feel to nature which is a slightly different concept to their attitudes towards nature. So, we gave them a statement, my connection to nature and the environment is a part of my spirituality. Very interestingly, 71% of visitors said they agreed with that statement. And this was something that came out very strongly in the study, and is starting to come out in other studies, is that South Africans have a very strong spiritual connection to nature. I'm not separate from nature, but a part of nature. 84% agreed with that statement. So this is important as we get to know our audience. And then something that's really important is whether or not people feel that they can make a difference. So it's something called locus of control, and it says either I feel that my actions can make a difference, or it feels that I'm just one person, the environmental problems are too big. And depending on people's locus of control will determine whether they actually want to participate in environmental behaviors in our case. So we ask people, I'm only one person, I can't make a difference to the environment. What percentage do you think agreed with that? 60. Intuitively, we would think it would be very high. 32%. My individual actions can make a difference to the environment. 93%. Okay, there's obviously some response bias there because I'm wearing my I Recycle Everyday t-shirt and I'm saying to you, can you make a difference? So there is response bias, naturally, but these are still pretty high results. Then because I was doing a PhD, I thought it needed to do something really fancy with the data. So what I did is I did some structural equation modeling, which looked at how attitudes to nature why they visited us, their connectedness to nature, and their attitudes to personal responsibility predicted learning. And what we found is that why they visited us was one of the most important predictors of their learning. So if they visited us because they were interested in the environment and because they wanted to learn, they would learn more naturally. But what we also found is that people who visited us because they wanted a social experience 
also learnt a lot. So that was quite interesting. Then we found attitude to nature and connectedness to nature were some of the strongest predictors of environmental learning. So this is helping us to understand what we need to change in our experiences and in our teaching, how we communicate with people in order to achieve the best results for environmental learning and behavioral intentions. Okay, I think maybe the tape's run out. <laughs> I'd like to just mention this quote, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Consequently, he who molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. So we can have as many laws as we like about the environment. Unless we can mold public sentiment, we're not going to achieve what we're trying to achieve. So I would say that what has all this got to do with understanding people? Ultimately, I think that when we're talking to people, when we're communicating, we're wanting to go beyond just sharing information, just sharing knowledge. We're trying to influence behavior. We don't want people just to know that climate change exists or that there's a problem with over-harvesting. We want people to change behavior. We want to influence their behavior. Now, when we think about changing behavior, who are the most effective people you know who have influenced your behavior? Which kind of group of people can influence people's behavior? Yes? A teacher. A teacher, yes. Who else can influence behavior? Parents. 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 Who else? Peer groups. Yes. Peer groups, yes. Has anyone ever bought something they didn't really want? <laughs> <laughs> the marketing industry is very good at influencing behavior. How many of you have heard messages about not smoking? How many people still smoke? Okay, that's another group is the public health domain has also been effective in influencing behavior. So in the environmental movement, we are looking now more and more to other fields to help guide our behavior change campaigns and our communication about behavior. We're really, really good at our science we haven't been really good at influencing behavior. And if we're going to solve many of the problems that we're facing, we're going to need to become better. So let's have a look at how some theories can help us. The first one I mentioned was smoking. This is a graph of cigarettes per capita in the US from 1900 to 2000. What happened round about here? Cancer. Cancer and widespread communication. Suddenly, you couldn't find cigarette adverts all over the place. So the public health field worked really, really hard in communicating the dangers of smoking and the impact of smoking. So we had lots of messages coming about what will happen if you smoke, and then we also started to see the influence of smoking on human health. So this is one field that has been effective in changing behavior. Has anyone heard about uh, skin cancer? Yes, people don't suntan nearly as much as they used to. Things like diet. So the public health field has done an incredible amount of research that we can learn from with respect to behavior change. So the first behavior change theory, one of the very first ones that came out was Edgerton's theory of planned behavior. And what it said is that anyone's behavior is influenced by the intention to do that behavior, which makes sense. And they said that the intention to do that behavior is influenced by your attitude, positive or negative, but it's also influenced by what other people are doing. So we are people, we work together, we're communities, we're influenced by what other people are doing. And this is a very strong factor influencing our behavior. And then the next one is perceived behavioral control, which is why when I mentioned, do we believe we can make a difference or not, it's quite important. Because if we believe that changing our behavior is within our capacity, if other people around us are doing it, and we have a positive attitude towards it, we will probably have the intention and undertake that behavior. So this is just one of the first theories that we've used. Then we come to Prochaska's stages of change. And this one is 
really interesting if we think about it with respect to dieting. Has anyone ever tried to go on a diet? Okay, only one and he's a male. My golly, you guys are really, really good. No one else here has ever tried a diet. Just Dennis. Oh, just Dennis, yes. Clearly. Either, either that or, or maybe I'm getting a bit of a bias in your responses. <laughs> so, if you think about it, everything starts at a pre-contemplation phase. You don't even realize that you look a little fat in those jeans. <laughs> then you get to the contemplation phase. That might be after your husband has said, hmm, tighter jeans today, <laughs> or something to that effect. Then you might think, right, I am definitely going to go on diet. Then you start the diet. How many of you who've started a diet have had a little relapse? <laughs> I'm one person. Thank you. <laughs> the rest of you, I think, are those little environmental angels. <laughs> relapse is very common, and it takes a long time and effort to stay on the maintenance. Think of this with recycling. Has anyone started enthusiastically recycling? How many of you are still recycling today? Okay, some yes, some no. This is really important in understanding that one communication, one intervention is not going to change behavior. It needs to be something that goes on for a long time. Then we start looking at marketing. And marketers are very skilled at changing our behavior. But in community-based social marketing, they're applying the principles of marketing to particularly environmental behavior. They generally work on one or two behaviors at a time, for example, recycling. And what they'll do is they'll focus on what are the barriers to that behavior. So what is stopping people doing what we want them to do? Because if you can remove those barriers, you've got a much better chance of encouraging the behavior that you're looking for. They generally work at a community level, and they work often one-on-one. -on -one. So this is one of the fields that we have applied some of the research to help us. Environmental education has been doing this for many, many years. A long time ago, environmental education involved field trips, taking kids particularly out into nature. It's changed since then. It's become a lot more rigorous, a lot more theoretical, and we can learn a lot from the environmental education field about behavior change. Interestingly, if you think that so many of our environmental challenges are orientated around people, the psychologists were rather latecomers in this field. And it's only in the late 1990s, early 2000s, that they really started to develop the field of conservation psychology. And what that does is look at the reciprocal nature of humans and the environment, and really focusing on how to encourage humans to care for nature. So psychologists are also entering into the field doing a lot of research on how to support environmental behavior. So, what does all of this have to do with us as communicators? How can we help people to really care for nature? The first lesson that we've learned is that we all wear invisible lenses. Each of us wears a lens that's based on our upbringing, it's based on our experiences, it's based on our family history. Each of us sees the world differently. And that's absolutely critical for us to understand if we're going to communicate effectively. And it doesn't matter whether we're delivering a presentation like this, or we're engaging with a school group, or we're working with a community of fishermen. It's really hard for us to take off our glasses and put on the lenses of somebody else. But that's a critical thing for us to do, is we need to be able to see the world through other people's eyes, which is why understanding their attitudes and views is so important. If we look at these two groups of fishermen, we could say they're both fishermen. But in actual fact, the experiences of this person, the experiences of this person are totally different. How you would approach this person is very different to how you would approach a rural person versus an urban person. So although they might be viewed as fishermen, they're very, very different. So understanding our audience. Remember that first lesson I had when I worked with those school children? Who is your audience? Who here knows that for every plate of prawns you eat, maybe seven or eight plates of other animals die? 
Who knows that? Okay, very few of you know that. If you knew that, do you think you would still eat prawns? <laughs> That's one of the sad things that we as scientists have had to realize, is that knowledge doesn't necessarily change behavior. <laughs> we can have all the knowledge in the world. We need to move beyond knowledge is if, if we actually want to influence behavior. So, we've learned very clearly that people are emotional and not rational. Our actions are driven largely by our emotions. And interestingly enough, guys, this applies to men as well as women. <laughs> The next thing is that people are generally selfish. You're all sitting here listening to me thinking, what am I getting out of this presentation? Inherently, we're selfish. What's in it for us? If we keep on doing our communication about us, we're not going to achieve our goals. We need to see what's in it for the people we're talking to. So remember, people are generally selfish. The next thing, something I mentioned earlier, is that we're influenced by what others are doing. Mayor Giuliani in New York, a long time or a little while ago, had what he called the Broken Window Project. And what that said was that he did not want any broken windows or graffiti in his city. And his police and people like that in his council said, but that's really minor stuff. I mean, it's a broken window, it's a bit of graffiti, so what? He said, that is the start of crime. If we can sort out the broken windows, we can sort out the crime. So we are influenced by what other people are doing. If we see a whole lot of litter lying there, it's so easy to chuck our litter down with it. So influencing people in groups is really important. We need to be able to understand that what others are doing will influence the people we're talking to. So we need to think about that in our communication. As an environmentalist, I think that this is a stunning picture and it really captures for me the environment. But most people do not value the environment for its own sake. They value the environment for what it can do for them. So often as environmentalists, we talk about conservation for the animals or for the environment. We don't talk about conservation for people. We need to put people at the center of our arguments. We need to put people at the center because most people don't value the environment for its own sake. And then, very encouragingly, is we all do have a spiritual connection to nature. And as I mentioned earlier, as South Africans, we've got a strong spiritual connection to nature. How do we enhance that spiritual connection to nature? How do we keep that topmost in people's minds? And particularly as we become more and more urban orientated, how do we enhance that spiritual connection to nature and reignite it in communities that may have lost it? But we all have different belief systems. A few hundred years ago, Galileo came up with an absolutely outlandish idea. He said that the Earth was no longer the center of the universe, and that it was actually the sun, and the Earth revolved around it. This went against the church, it went against basic common sense. I mean, obviously, the earth was the center of the universe. It took a long time for him to be proved right. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to explain to people that a gas that I exhale all the time that makes up a very tiny percentage of the air around us is changing the climate. I mean, you must be joking. We're challenging beliefs. And it's been said that in the battle between beliefs and facts, beliefs generally win. So things take time. We're not going to solve some of our challenges instantly. We do all have different belief systems. We need to respect that and work with it. Something else that's really important is who is as important as what is communicated. If you're trying to talk to fishermen about a marine protected area that is going to stop them fishing, it's a really good idea to have a fisherman talking to them. Somebody who shares their values, 
somebody who is credible and they trust. So who is really important in our communication, especially when we're working with groups that have got very, very ingrained ideas. So who is a critical component? The next thing that's important is timing. This is just a shot of some work that we did up in Cozy Bay area. And we went in to do some training with local community members. And we were ready and going at 8 o'clock in the morning. And there was nobody there. And by 10 o'clock, there was still nobody there. And eventually, by 12 o'clock, the community had arrived. But they really wanted to kill us. And we couldn't work out what was going on until we realized a large number of the community members had actually been arrested the night before. It was not the right time. So we need to be sensitive to what's happening in a community if we're wanting our messages to be heard. Something that we've noticed as well is that commitments are effective. Has anyone ever made a promise to somebody? Okay, besides Dennis. <laughs> in this case, actually, he hasn't made a promise. <laughs> okay, anyone ever made a promise? Yes. How do you feel when you don't keep that promise? A little bit guilty. We found this in the environmental field, is encouraging people to make a pledge is actually being quite effective in follow-up behavior. Ah, oh, one of my favorite ones are scientists. <laughs> Choose your language carefully. As scientists, we really, really manage to make sure that nobody understands what we say. <laughs> when scientists say theory, people hear something completely different. They'll say, hmm, speculation, maybe it's just an idea. When scientists say uncertainty, uh, the people will say, hmm, I don't think they're really sure. When scientists say error, what do people think? It's a mistake, yes. When scientists say probability, people hear, hmm, maybe. And finally, <laughs> I know we've all experienced this one. <laughs> when scientists say field trip, I know people generally hear holiday. <laughs> Think about your language. We have created around us a language that excludes other people. We need to think very carefully about how we communicate to make sure that our language is inclusive as opposed to exclusive. The next thing that's coming through clearly in a lot of research, when we ask people why they want to recycle, why they want to conserve something, why they want to do an environmental behavior, generally we're getting this reason as being one of the most important ones. It's for my grandchildren. It's for my children. So when you're trying to encourage somebody to look at an environmental behavior differently, think about future generations. It's a very strong motivating factor in supporting environmental change. And then my favorite one is getting out into nature. How many of us went on field trips when we were young? Okay, how many kids do field trips these days? We're seeing in our case fewer and fewer kids doing field trips because of health and safety concerns, because of concerns with buses, with concerns with the Department of Education. We need to get children out into nature. A little while ago, we did a research study where we asked kids around the whole of South Africa to write an essay, and the topic of the essay was, how do we engage the youth of South Africa in the environment? What came through from most of those essays was, take us out into nature. Let us learn to love nature before you ask us to save it. And the one memorable essay said, how do you expect us to care for nature when the only mouse we know lives next to our computer. <laughs> <laughs> and then something that we also need to remember is no bad news too early. When we tell children about the rhino poaching crisis or about climate change, little people are not able to process that information. So we need to make sure that we let them love nature before we start asking them to save it. So Think about the age at which we introduce children to bad news. Not too early, the research says, because what happens then is children just close off completely. They can't emotionally cope with that bad news. Then another one that I found very difficult. 
How many of you have seen a poster or an email or a Facebook post or something like this? Support our marine protected area. It's a good thing. Yeah. <coughs> so what do you want me to do? <laughs> Have any of you seen those rhino poaching posters that say, stop poaching? <laughs> okay, I've personally never actually poached a rhino. <laughs> I don't know anybody who has. And I'm pretty sure that the poacher on the other side is not going, oh my golly, look at that sign. Oh, well, best I stop now. <laughs> Okay, we need to be specific in our calls to action. What do you want people to do? And this is one that I've struggled with. What do we want people to do with respect to marine protected areas? So maybe we need to say, sign the petition to support the marine protected area. Visit your local marine protected area. Obey the regulations when you're in the protected area. So we need to be specific in our calls to action. It's pretty, pretty important. General calls are not going to get there. And then the next thing is to encourage that personal responsibility. So help people to know what to do and then say, we know you can do it. So instead of trying to tell people, oh, we're never going to solve the problem, help them to take personal responsibility. Solving this crisis is up to all of us. Give them the tools and then let people take that personal responsibility. And then uncovering barriers to action. When I first started at SeaWorld, one of my jobs was to communicate with fishermen. And I would go to lots and lots of fishing competitions. And generally at the end of the fishing competition, there would be a pile of dead fish, particularly sharks like this. Because to get your points as a fisherman in the competition, you needed to weigh your fish. To weigh your fish, you needed to kill it. Over the years, our scientists have come up with weight length regressions. And now what fishermen do is they can measure their fish, work out what the weight is, and they use that to get their points. So that's uncovering the barriers and overcoming those barriers. So what is stopping people doing what you want them to do? Because perhaps if you can overcome those barriers, you'll be able to encourage that behavior. And then the next one is to actually support thinking and reflection. So often we're so busy when we work in our communications and working with people, we're so busy talking. We very seldom let people just sit quietly and think. And this is something that I found in the aquarium. Whenever we do a guided tour, we are so busy talking to people, we don't actually give them a chance just to sit down and enjoy the environment around them, just to slow down and to think. And the research has shown very, very clearly from my stuff that reflection and thinking and just letting people slow down is one of the best predictors of environmental learning. So how do we support people just to think a little bit more? Something that also comes through in many studies is emphasizing the interconnectedness of nature. This is something that we seem to find intuitive. So when we talk about the web of life, people understand that concept of the web of life. So use that unraveling the web of life unravels humans at the center. So how do we communicate about that web of life? People understand it. For years and years and years, our environmental movement has focused on loss. We see those terrible pictures of albatrosses with stomachs filled with plastic, of turtles that have, that have been drowned, all sorts of things that tell us all about the loss. The research now, particularly from the conservation psychology movement, is telling us to preach love, not loss. Because clearly we're not really achieving our goals with all of these sad, sad stories. Then something else we need to do is to find the hope. Interestingly now, some international studies have shown that we, as a science field, the environmental movement, are starting to attract inherently negative people into our field. Because we are coming across as a group of inherently negative people. It's very, very sad because all we're doing at the moment is telling bad news stories. The environment is shot. It's over. Unless we all change our behavior, we don't have any hope. We need to find the stories of hope. Those stories of hope are absolutely critical, especially if we want to inspire a new generation. 
We want to be people that are positive about the environment. We can make a difference. So we need to find those good news stories. They recently held a conservation optimism summit in the UK to encourage just this, encourage good news stories. And then another thing we need to look at is how to make our messages and our stories memorable. This was a scientist and he wanted to show what polluted water looked like. He wanted to make it memorable. So he made it into popsicles, something that everyone can understand. As humans, we visual long before we're verbal or before we start reading. So how can you make your messages visual and easy to understand? And then the next thing, speak to the heart and show your passion. Here are a couple of the most passionate fishermen. They're also passionate conservationists, and they're actually good scientists too. As scientists, we have been taught to distance ourselves from our science. When you read a paper, nobody ever did the research because it was found that. The results noted that. We distance ourselves from our research. But people are people first. Share your passion. You're allowed to be passionate about what you care about. Remember we said right at the beginning, people are emotional before being rational. So it's okay to share your passion. In fact, that's more likely to inspire somebody than some dry statement about the research noted that. And then the next thing is tell stories. Think about that story of old four legs. What were the ingredients that made it so successful? Why does everyone still know the story of the coelacanth? It was before social media and all the rest of it. It wasn't just a dry story about an old fish. It had elements of surprise. It had elements of wonder. It had the odd dinosaur creep in. It was stories about <coughs> people. It was a story about a human discovery. It was told in a way that people were automatically interested in. It wasn't just published once put onto the uh, transactions of the Royal Society as a paper and left. It was a story with human interest. So as scientists, how can we tell better stories? We've been sitting around campfires as humans telling stories all our lives. How can we tell better stories of our science? But then please don't shower people you're talking to with your fire hose of knowledge. <laughs> Often we're so busy telling people everything we know, like that first guided tour of mine, we put people off completely. So tell our stories, but choose what you want to say carefully so that you don't shower them with a fire hose. <laughs> and I come back to the fact that one-on-one -on -one interaction is still very, very useful. We might think it's old-fashioned, but talking to people one-on-one -on -one is a very effective way of communicating. But then also, we can try something different. When we were used, looking at the uh, Tsitsi Karma campaign, we wanted to try and encourage people to see the fish in Tsitsi Karma. We wanted them to know about the fish in Tsitsi Karma, which is why we wanted the protected area to stay closed. And we had to think about how are we going to communicate this to lots of people, and we only had about three weeks to do it in. So we decided to try social media. I'm not a social media fan at all, but we decided we were going to try it. And we started with something called Fun Fishy Facts, where we put together some facts about different species of fish, and we've used it in social media. We're now getting between 25 and 30,000 people looking at these posts. They're starting to be shared amongst the, the fishing clubs. Maybe we've got a bit of the wrong tone, because the one I saw was here, boys, your next lesson from Fun Fishy Facts. But anyway, whatever it is, people are starting to take note. I still have my doubts about the long-term impact of social media, whether it really does change behavior, but at least fishermen are starting to understand how old some of our fish are, where they live, how they move. So it is something that we can try, and it's something that is effective if it's used very, very carefully. I'd like to ask you this question. Yeah. 
Who thinks scientists should be activists? Who thinks scientists should absolutely stick to the facts, put it out there, and see what happens? Ah, yes, we have one brave per uh, Ag you too, Agus, yes. It's a tricky one. There are pros and cons. Some people feel that by moving into the activist space, you're losing your objectivity <coughs> as a scientist. Others say if you don't move into the activist space, you might as well not be doing the science in the first place. So there are two sides to this argument. If you are going to become an activist and you really want to, to tackle an issue, think about it very carefully. If you do decide to take the government to court, make sure you've got good financial backing. <laughs> And then something that resonates with some of the other comments I've made is that so often we get so serious with what we do. We need to have fun. A lot of our visitors, particularly in our aquarium, say you learn more when you're having fun. Often we try and tell our terrible stories or our wonderful stories, but we're very serious about them. We can have fun too. We're going to remember stuff if we have fun. And then something that I think is really important for all of us is to remember why. Why did we get into this game in the first place? We need to feed our own souls. Has anyone ever felt a touch of eco-depression? <laughs> eco-depression is now a clinical field. It's a clinically diagnosable condition. And in America, you can pay a lot to a therapist who will help you work through your eco-depression. <laughs> Only in America. South Africa, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> so in South Africa, what we do is we just get out into nature. Try getting out into nature and just reminding yourself whatever it is that got you into this in the first place. If we can't fill our souls and if we can't keep positive, we're never going to be able to communicate effectively. So remembering why we got into this in the first place is critical and moving through eco-depression and being positive. There's now something called hashtag ocean optimism where they try to only share good news stories about the oceans. So getting out there into nature is really important. In fact, it's found some of the research that's been done internationally. Apparently your stress hormones, cortisol, go down by 16% after a walk in nature. So it's far more effective than any of the drugs that we could be taking. So let's just get out into nature. Okay, so that's some of the formulas. Hopefully there's some ideas there that you can apply in your own communication. But I just want to give you one example where we're using many of these principles in a behavior change campaign that we're running in our aquarium. And here we ask our visitors to make a promise to the penguin. <coughs> so on a postcard, they handwrite a promise to the penguin. Handwriting it is important. They don't tick like. It's not a computer thing. They actually have to think about what they're going to write. And then we email them with a survey normally between a year or two years later. And we want to know if people are keeping their promises. Are they actually recycling as they said they would? Are they saving water, whatever it is? And the results have been pretty astounding. 49% of the respondents could actually explain very clearly what they have done in terms of environmental behavior as a result of their visit and their promise. And that's really, really powerful. So it's very strong. What's also we found quite interesting with that is that many of these people have explained to us what else they've done. So they've explained to their school group. They did a talk at their school group. They went to the church. They encourage their office to recycle or whatever it is. So we're getting a multiplier effect. So this is just one example, a small example, where we believe some of these principles are working. And you amongst you have got many, many good examples of behavior change campaigns, even if you didn't call them a campaign, working with fishermen, where behaviors are changing. So we are getting this right slowly, slowly. Ultimately, the environment is critical to all of us. We want that environment to endure into the future. But we need to put people at the center of our work. We need to be able to communicate more effectively if we hope for our environment to continue. So that's why I disagree with the statement. And I'd like to change 
And we scientists can contribute to that. Because if we are not prepared to go out there and to stand up for our science and to be effective communicators and to share our passion for the environment, nobody else is going to do it for us. It really is up to us to make these changes. And I'd like to just end with my favorite quote. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. It really is up to us. We may think of ourselves as a small group of people, but together we can change the world. Thank you very much, all of you, for listening. <laughs>
they South do. Africa should jump on the bandwagon. Kenya has uh, yeah. as well. You know, yeah. so. And I think that there are definitely positives with that, and they have got psychologists that seem to be helping them with, with the campaign, so they are giving that hope. But it's, it's a very fine, it's a very fine line. But also something that we've worked on over and over and over is that concept of awareness. Awareness is one step, and part of this campaign is awareness, but it's showing people what they can do, so that empowering has to come through with it, which is important. So if you've got something that's got the loss, it's got the hope stories and it's got what you can do to solve the problem, then you've got a good communication chain. We've got time for one last question. Yeah. Julia, I noticed that uh, Sitsikama legal document was dated 2015. Uh, the other day over the news we heard that the Minister and Nature Conservation in fact do want to open Sitsikama to fishing. Uh, what is the news on that front? Okay, so in December 2015, there, or actually in November 2015, there was a proposal to open Tsitsikama, parts of Tsitsikama, 20% to fishing, and it was open for public comment for a three month period. Then on about the 12th, 15th of December, they decided to open it anyway, just as a little test. That's where that court case came from. So that court case was in response to the illegal opening of Tsitsikama by the government. So what we looked for there was an urgent interdict to close it again until the comment period had been completed. And that was the court case that was held in the Pretoria High Court. So two trips to the Pretoria High Court is more than any scientist really wants to do. But ultimately we won the case. It was a landmark case because the government had broken about six different laws of their own laws. So we did win the case, and then the area was closed, and then it had to go through the public comment phase. What we did after that was really, really try to get people to comment. So we got over 700 literally personal comments to the government in support of keeping it closed. Unfortunately, those 700 comments were ignored by the government, and they have opened it. So that brings up a whole lot of other problems, but it was opened through a legal process. What that court case was about the illegal opening, which is why we won that court case. But it's a, as I say, if you do decide to take legal action, you need to think very carefully about it. It's not, not for the faint-hearted. One last question, Fred. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm a teacher and I'm at the School of Language right next door. And I'm using eco-criticism and geocriticism to analyze novels. I wanted to find out in your work, how are you using storytelling, fiction, drama, and theater to actually get to the public, to get them to express their spirituality with nature? That's a, a lovely question. And we've just started a project now working with Tina Flope. And she's helping us to tell environmental stories because she's got such a deep understanding of that spiritual connection to nature. So we use a lot of puppet shows. That's, that's proved very effective. We use drama and then storytelling. So those are some of the things that we're starting to engage in. So I think it's a very powerful space, especially with that spiritual connection. And I think it's something that as scientists, when last did you do a little acting? <laughs> <laughs> Every day. <laughs> it's a space we're not, we're not comfortable with. But in fact, it's a space that we need to start engaging. I think we need to... We need to work with religious bodies, we need to work with the arts. There are so many areas that we can work with to help this whole environmental challenge that we're, we're faced. Because it, it's up to us, we can't wait for somebody else. The artists are not going to come to us. We need to be able to go to them. So I think that that's a, a very exciting space for us. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, we have a little gift for you, um, which I hope you enjoy will be close to the heart and it's done by one of my very own staff so you will enjoy it. Thank you.